Uh, Jeffrey, as you may know, is a member of the Department of Business and Economics, and uh, he is going to be talking about a title that I can't remember, uh, and I'm sure he can, so uh, please welcome. Thanks, Barry. Um, this paper is uh, talking about economic development across countries. So uh, the interest in this topic sprung from my experience being from India and then my research, uh, which deals with issues of poverty and underdevelopment. Uh, what I do is, um, in this paper, we look at various factors that can contribute towards countries having diverse income levels. Uh, if you look at per capita income, um, which is a measure of development commonly used in the economic literature. Uh, Luxembourg, the richest country in the world, has a per capita GDP of around $45,000. Uh, on the other end, Sierra Leone, $130 per capita GDP. The wide disparity in income level across countries. Um, economists have been trying to unravel this mystery as to why do we have such disparities across countries' development levels. Uh, there were several models proposed which showed that countries will converge in their growth rates across time. Uh, if at all we see divergences across countries' growth rates. So this has spawned a large amount of empirical literature, both theoretical models and data studies, trying to figure out why countries, uh, why some countries seem to be locked in this poverty trap, while some countries just take off and grow so fast. Uh, back in the 50s, the common approach was what we call a Solus growth model. So this model was fairly simple. It said accumulate physical capital, build machines and factories and plants, and the countries will go on high income growth path eventually. Uh, but this model has not been um, found true empirically because the World Bank's focus was in building plants. They invested in physical capital. And they built huge factories, huge infrastructure projects in various countries, and nothing really took off from that. So in fact, over the past few years, World Bank has changed its focus from developing or investing in physical capital or machines to investing in people. Because they realized that they have to um, look at different models of development. Um, but the standard economic theory says invest in education, build machines and equipment, uh, invest in workers, have the right policies, and the countries will grow. But we know what the formula is, and still we do not see results which show the countries are growing. Uh, over the past 10 years, the focus has shifted in looking at what we call some deeper determinants of development. Uh, the idea is that there are some underlying factors that interact with human capital, physical capital, policies, etc. And it is its interaction which results in development. So these are called the deep determinants of development. These are the factors behind what meets the eye the factors behind the success of machines, success of factories, the success of banks, the success of industry. And the research has categorized these factors in three broad categories. They call institutions, trade, and geography. Um, and the idea is that each of these three factors interplay with the proximate factors which are uh, policies, physical capital, human capital. And it's this interplay which pins down the level of development of countries. So um, in this paper, I'll examine the role that these three broad factors play in development, and whether we can explain development as measured by per capita income based on these three factors. And then I'd be happy to take questions as we go along, so feel free to interrupt me, and we'll just have it in formal conversational settings, so I'll just ask, take any questions. So the first main factor is geography. And there was a paper done by Jeffrey Sachs in 01, and he said that geography is all that really matters. So 
his analysis is very bleak. It doesn't matter what institutions you have. It doesn't matter what level of trade or openness you have. If you are stuck in bad geographical climate, you are struck with high levels of disease, uh, unhospitable climate, and that determines your path for longer term growth. So countries which are trapped in tropics or in poor climatic zones cannot really grow. That was his analysis. Uh, and Jeffrey Sachs has been doing tremendous work uh, in trying to combat disease in Africa, and he has huge charity endowments. You know, so he's done tremendous work spurred from his idea that geography is the key determinant of development. Uh, the other way in which geography plays out in development is that geography determines whether you're landlocked or whether you're a coastal country, whether you're close to other trade <laughs> partners or not. So if you are a coastal nation close to other countries, you will trade more. Um, and then you will have access to world markets, new ideas, and that spurs growth and development. Uh, the third approach looks at the endowments a country is bestowed with, the kind of crops that have been cultivated. So for instance, if a country is predominantly cash crop oriented economy, then the structures that emerge are exploitative. If a country has food crops, the more equitable structures which evolve over time. And it is these structures and institutions that impact development. And all these papers have found um, a lot of support to these hypotheses, and they have been uh, found true to empirical testing. Uh, trade impacts development through a variety of settings. Countries which trade more have access to world markets. They can sell their products. And as they produce more, they learn better by doing, and they get more efficient in what they're producing. Uh, and we see the experience of East Asia and a lot of countries where growth was driven by trade. Uh, trade helps you get access to new technologies, which you couldn't have available to you if you were doing it on your own. Trade provides exchange of ideas between countries. Um, and all these factors, in turn, affect capital structures, capital formations, education level, and they affect development. So um, what this model says is that if a country has same conditions, but is more close to trade, it will not grow as fast as a country which trades more. Um, institutions are defined broadly as structures which underline how people interact with each other, how markets behave. Uh, Douglas North was a pioneer in putting forward the institutional argument for development, and he won a Nobel Prize based on his hypotheses. Uh, he says that institutions or contract enforcement cuts down the cost of doing business. Um, it facilitates development of markets, development of market structures, uh, which eventually lead to higher growth and development. If you have better institutions, you have better property rights, better contract enforcement. Firms can recover their returns on investment, so they do not shy from investing in capital, in infrastructure, in equipment. Um, and all these factors result in providing a higher base for growth. Now, Douglas North distinguishes between the organization and institutions. Institutions are the rules of the game. Organizations are the players in that setting. So for instance, if a country has better law, better code, stronger judiciary, contracts will be enforced better there. Now, whether that country relies on small neighborhood banking or large banks, these are the players. But as long as the ground level is right, both these institutions will thrive. So it doesn't matter whether you go the big route or the small route, big companies, small companies, as long as you have laws in place to conducive to growth and business, these things will develop. So I'll just briefly summarize uh, where we are and how we have got to these three terminals. Um, there were a couple of 
very significant papers which looked at the impact of trade in development. So Sachs, who says trade doesn't matter, earlier had a paper which says that trade is all that matters. Uh, and geography is not as important. Franklin and Romer came up with a paper in uh, Journal of International Economics, a very leading economic journal. And in that journal, they argue that countries which trade more are the ones who grow faster. So, and even if we control for institutions, trade still dominates uh, the factors underlying development. And this was adopted by the World Bank in a big way, and IMF, in which it pushed for countries to open up more to the world trading regime so that they can partake in this growth process. Um, then Sachs, Gallup, and Melinda came up with another paper in which they look at <coughs> geography. And they say that, well, you can have trade, you can have good institutions, but you are destined by the geography that you have. So that's the most underlying factor for development. So its hypothesis is that if you have bad geography, you can't really grow. You are just stuck in this poor poverty trap. Um, then there was a very um, significant paper in the economic literature by Ace Moglu et al. And what they do is they look at the importance of institutions in development. But the problem is that if a country has high income levels, it probably has better rules, better law and order, better policing, better court system. So it's very difficult to see what causes what. Right? So we need to break this correlation and find out causation. <coughs> so what they say is that, well, if we can find variables that affect institutions but do not affect income, and then if we see that those variables are significant, um, then we will have a good result. <clears throat> so what they do is they look at the settler mortality in 1500s. They look at countries that were colonized by settlers. Uh, they see the if a country was disease-ridden, settlers, when they moved there, were there with the purpose of exploiting the resources and moving out. <laughs> If the country had equitable climate, then settlers wanted to settle long term, like in the US or Australia versus countries in Africa. So if your intention was to settle long term, then you had the right institutions in place. And those right institutions back in the 1500s affect institutions today, and they in turn affect income levels today. So this breaks down correlation and helps us look at causation. So in their paper, they look at geography, trade, and institutions together. They do a horse race. And they find that institutions are the dominant factor. Geography doesn't really matter. Trade does play a role, but it's not as strong as institutions. And this paper was published in AER, which is the best um, journal in economics. Uh, then Easterly and Levine, they again revisit this debate. Um, they look at endowments. So they say, okay, let's look at the endowments of the climatic conditions of a country in present times. Endowments do not affect income levels. Sorry, income levels do not affect endowments, but endowments can affect income levels. So we again have a causation. So they control for institutions and trade, and they find that geography, as captured by the endowments of natural resources, is what dominates the three variables. So geography matched for development. So again, we thought we had a resolution, and again we are thrown off by other researchers to say that geography matters. Then Roderick, Subramaniam, and Trevi come up with another paper, and they revisit the data by S. Noglu and by Eastern and Levine. And in their study, they find that no, it's institutions that matter. Um, geography doesn't really matter trade sometimes has a negative impact on development. And this finding has kind of led to some of their later research in which they have a very pessimistic view of trade and talk very highly of institutions. So these papers were very credible papers by very credible economists, and but we are confused as to what really matters. <laughs> you know. uh, then comes Jeffrey Sachs with another paper which says that no, it's only geography. So all these papers are wrong, 
and that's geography that really matters and nothing else really matters. So if you're poor, you're poor because of you have bad geography and you'll be always poor. Um, so then another paper comes which says no trade matters. So it's confusing, right? We really do not know which of these three matter. The fact is that all three seem to be important, but these papers have differing conclusions about what factor is the stronger factor. And if we accept the premise that geography is the one that really matters and nothing else matters, then we really can't do anything about those countries. They have bad disease environment, they have bad endowments, they're landlocked, so they are just stuck with where they are. No matter what you do, nothing can be done. Now, one common problem with all these papers is that they look at cross-section. So what they do is they look at average income levels from 1950 to 1990. They look at average level of institutions, the average trade level. So for each country, they have one data point. And they've clumped everything together and taken averages. Uh, so this is what we call a cross-section approach. So that's what their main equation is when they estimate the results. They have um, log of income. They have institutions, trade, and geography. What they assume is that, let's say we have 100 countries in our sample. Okay. We get a common parameter estimate on institutions, a common estimate on trade, a common estimate on geography. The underlying assumption in these models is that these countries are identical to each other. Okay. They have different levels of income, but how institutions interact in that country is the same. So institutional strength in Sierra Leone is the same as that in the US. It has the same explanatory power, which we know is not really true. Right? Um, institutions or the way a country responds to trade is pinned down by each country's individual characteristics. This model fails to take account of individual differences across countries. So what this model does is it ascribes stronger explanatory power to these betas than what it should really be. So this is a flawed model in that regard because it's too simplistic. It fails to account for country differences. And these country differences sometimes are not observed. Like if you've been to other countries, you know that there's some difference between, let's say, US and Guatemala, but you can't really pin down. Because there's some difference in the way businesses work, the corporate culture, the way policing is done. But you can't really pin down or measure this difference. Right? So, what, so the step forward then, is to see whether we can control for these cross-country differences in our analysis. So I do that using panel data. So I allow these countries to have different unobservable features in the model. And the assumption is that, let me show up my model. So this mu, or u, this is a country, an observable feature. i is for countries and t is for time. Okay. So when we see i, these are country specific variables. And t is country and time. So in this model, I say that there are variables which are specific to countries, or country and observable features. We need to account for these features. Now, it's also possible that institutions interact with country differences and then affect development. <coughs> the previous model did not have this variable. It assumed that all countries behave in the same way. They have the same characteristics, same features. They are exactly the same except for differences in policing, rules of law, differences in trade. This model is a more general model. It says that, well, Countries can differ because they have different levels of policing, different levels of institutions, different levels of judiciary. They're also different because they have different underlying features. 
which may not change over time, which may stay constant over time. So, now, why hasn't this been done before in the literature? Panel data so far has two main branches. One is fixed effects. So fixed effects model assumes that all variables, whether it's trade, institutions, or geography, are related to country features. Um, and so the way it approaches the estimation is, let's say we find that trade, or the impact of trade is different across each country. Let's take the average cross time of the trade variable for that country and subtract its mean. <laughs> Am I losing you? Is this too? That's no, good. So, so when you take differences, what happens is that for this model to work in the fixed effect setting, we need to have all variables which are varying in time. So geography should be varying over time. Institutions should be varying over time. Trade should be varying over time. Is that true? Geography is fixed, right? It doesn't change over time. So when you do this model, by its nature, it will remove geography from the equation. You can't measure the effect of geography. So this model by itself cannot explain the effect of geography. You can just look at trade and institutions. And some papers did that. There's a new technique. It's not new. It was developed in 1989, but has not been used a lot. It's, by, it's called Hoffman and Taylor estimation. Uh, the beauty of this model is this model allows for some variables to not change over time. They're country specific, but they do not change over time. Variables like geography, which stay constant. There are some variables which change over time. So between 1950 and 2000, the <coughs> US has probably become more trade-oriented. The laws have become stronger. So these things have changed over time. But US geography has stayed the same. I'm just wondering if geography counts like when places have been denuded. Doesn't that change the geography? Places that have been? Well, that's been deforested. Which, yeah. So what I have is, I have various measures of geography. Okay. Um, so we'll see we have endowments as well. But Doesn't geography also depend on technology? How far away is Africa? Depends on whether you're talking about a sailing ship, a steamship, or an airplane. And whether or not your country has oil matters depending on whether you uh, have an industrial economy based on oil or one not based on oil. True. So uh, what I have in this study is a variety of measures of geography. Measures which look at endowments of oil plus which look at some underlying features independent of technological progress. That's the measure which Sachs came up with. I'll explain my data set and then we can see that we cover a variety of variables in the study. Um, though what I do in this study is I do not apply the Hausman and Taylor model blindly to the data. I let data say which model to pick. So I do a variety of pre-test things to determine if we have cross-country differences in these variables, what's the appropriate technique, um, and then I run the final model based on what the data has said about the underlying features of that data. So we have a variety of estimation equations, a variety of model specifications, and each is tested before we implement it in the paper, whether it's the right specification or not. So, now, we have 50 years worth of data, but that has a lot of variation. Each year the business cycle fluctuations. So the common practice in literature is to take decadal averages. So over a decade, things will smoothen out. 
Um, and that's what we do in this paper as well. We take 10 year averages. So we have 40 years worth of data, 1960 to 2000. So we have four time periods. <coughs> now, as we said before, it's possible that institutions today affect income today, but income today affects institutions today. Right. So we still need to do find a third variable which breaks this link. In the Hosman and Taylor model, the way it's specified right now, we can incorporate that into the estimation. So what we do in this paper is we take a 10-year lag of institutions. So institutions 10 years ago affect today's income, but today's income cannot affect institutions 10 years ago. Right. So again, we break this um, correlation and we can look at causations. We do the same for trade and for all other time varying variables where we can take that little averages. For explaining 10 years ago, if you had, what was your trade and the impact of that in today's income? So for institutions, um, we have a very large data set, more than 100 variables for 150 countries over 40 years. Um, spent a lot of time in my back trying to just compile this data set from a variety of sources. Uh, in this paper, for institutions, we use a measure which is called contract intensive money. Uh, what this measure measures is it looks at the amount of money in formal sector, so in the banking sector or in financial sector. The idea is that if you have a large amount of money in formal institutions, the country has to have stronger laws. In a country where there are no contracts being enforced, people like to hold cash, or they like to hold gold, or they make investments in stuff that they keep in their house. So it's not in the main sector. Um, and this variable was proposed in a paper in 1996, and it was found to be a very strong determinant of institutions. So this has been empirically tested, and we use that measure. Um, we also look at some political variables, uh, like number of veto players. Veto players are defined as um, the number of parties in the executive. So a prime minister and his party, and number of parties in coalition. Or president and his party, number of parties in his coalition. So these are the decision makers, and if you have more competition here, you have a stronger and robust democracy. Uh, we look at electoral competitiveness index. <coughs> what percent of seats were taken by just the leading party? Uh, if the leading party had just one candidate, which took all the seats, the index is zero. Uh, if the leading party got less than 60% of the seats, the index is 7. And it's a World Bank data set from which I took this variable. So it shows that there's more competition in the election process. Uh, then democracy index constraints on the executive, 0 being he has absolute power, 7 being the executive has a parity of power. So there are checks and balances in place. Um, and then democracy as well. <coughs> We also have some variables which are measured at one point in time and which stay fairly stable. Uh, rule of law. This is a fairly new measure. It was available only from 1996 to 2000. Uh, so we assume it's been the same over time. So it's a time invariant variable. Then the origin of legal system, whether French or British. Then dummies for Sub-Saharan Africa versus East Asia versus uh, Middle East and North America, North Africa. For trade, the most common measure is trade share, amount of trade as a percent of GDP. So we have that. We also have um, an index which looks at openness. So this variable looked at seven indicators, amount of tariffs, amount of protection, amount of openness to trade, and counted those indexes and aggregated them into a scale from zero to seven. So we have that. Uh, we also look at import tariffs. 
and taxes on trade. So if a country is more open to trade, there's less tariff and less taxes on trade, vice versa. Uh, exchange rate overvaluation and black market premium. So a country which prevents free trade or controls capital or movement of foreign exchange has a high black market premium. People have a side market in which they trade in foreign exchange. For geography, uh, relative distance from the equator, and again, it's over 40 years, so things have been fairly uh, stable. Malaria ecology, this is the measure which Jeffrey Sachs developed. Now, his argument is that as medicine advances, we get a better handle on malaria. So it's possible that income levels mean less disease or less malaria. In this measure, he looks at, or he controls for income advances. He controls for medicine advances. Uh, and he says that this is a truly exogenous measure, which hasn't changed over time. And even after we account for improvements in medicine, income levels, it is what determines disease environment. So, uh, percent of land in tropics, dummy for non-European landlocked countries, uh, hydrocarbons, and then a crop index which was proposed by Eastern and Levine in their paper on endowments. So I'll quickly move on to the results. So, too small. The first, so this table looks at what Roderick et al. did. They looked at institution trade and geography in a cross-section setting, and they said institutions matter the most. Geography does not matter. We replicate their findings. Uh, this is Roderick's findings, and this is our findings, which are in line with what Roderick found. Now, these are our panel data findings. Uh, the way to read these, the stars mean that these results are statistically significant. That they matter for explaining the facts. In our study, the top part is institutions. This is trade. This is geography. <coughs> if you see, all these have statistical significance. All these variables matter, unlike the previous study where it's only institutions that matter. Geography had no use, and not, neither did trade. So the only stars were for institutions, and that, that was the finding by Roderick et al. In our panel data finding, what I see is that all three matter. Institutions matter, trade matters, and so does geography. And this result is generally true in a variety of settings. So uh, these are small. I'll just plug in my overall estimation. So this summarizes my results. Uh, what we s elasticity is defined by economists as percent change in one variable caused by percent change in the other variable. It is a measure of responsiveness of one to the other. As I said, in the previous papers, people found that only institutions matter. Geography and trade had no impact on development. Uh, that was the last finding by Roderick et al. And after that, not much work was done in this area. Um, in my paper, I find that institutions matter. They're in the same unit because elasticities. They have the strongest impact on development. It's positive. Trade as well <coughs> matters. Trade also has a positive impact, but which one is stronger? Institutions. 
the other finding that I find is that geography also does matter. Geography has a negative impact because all the variables we saw were negative in terms of, um, so we pick malaria. However, the impact is much weaker than trade and institutions. So our benchmark was Roderick's results, and we confirmed his findings. In a cross-section, and we assume all countries are behaving the same way, it's only institutions that matter. Trade, no impact. Geography, doesn't really matter. In the panel data setting, which is a fuller uh, model for the data, we find that all three matter. And this is more intuitive. You know, This is what we think is more acceptable. And we know that geography matters, we know institutions matter, we know trade matters. We've seen countries' um, experiences correlate with these variables very strongly. We also find, though, that institutions matter the most. Trade has the positive impact, and geography has the smallest impact, though negative. So the key findings in which we think have significant implications for policy are that if you have bad geography, you're not stuck in a lower poverty trap. Having the right institutions can help overcome the impediments which bad geography may bring. We also say that trade, though we don't oversell trade, that trade is not the strongest thing that matters, so we can say only open up to trade, have weak markets, have weak laws, but open up to trade, that really doesn't work. If the rules of the game are strong, then trade also plays a significant impact and it's positive. So the first thing is to fix the right policies, have better contact enforcement, have better law and order, have a market system conducive for firms to develop and grow. Um, then open up to trade as well, which is a positive impact. And these two variables can overcome the negative impact of geography. So you're not destined by your you know, lot. Um, there are some possible extensions. Um, on the theory side, right now there are no theoretical models which specifically look at these three variables and model them. Um, so that's a possible extension. The second one is to have a better framework for breaking the link between the causation or correlation. Uh, Hosman and Taylor model, we just do a lag 10 year back averages of trade variables and decision variables on current entry. But there's no formal model which incorporates a third variable in the HT framework. And I'm working on that. And I probably think I have developed an estimator which will work with this. Well. We'll test it in the summer and see if we can get it out. So any questions? Yeah. So your, your model explains, excuse me, your, your model so these three things matter, the mm -hmm. institutions, the geography, the tree. But does it provide a better estimator than the other models? So it says these three factors matter, but is it a better estimator? Um, it is a better, better estimator in the sense that it models the data more fully. Uh, it takes account of cross-country variations which are unobservable. And even based on that, we see all three are significantly important for development. So if one were to base its policy implications, this would be a better model to base your results on. Knowing this, you can be encouraged, or one can be encouraged by the fact that you know, all three matter. And so let's see how we can then form the right institutions, the right trade policies uh, to grow. What we do not do is we do not propose any particular policies in this model. Right now. I was wondering, uh, institutions can be formal or informal, the informal ones being sort of cultural norms. Mm -hmm. Did you do any interactive effects? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing the, here that you, you've done the formal side, yes? The mu i yeah. or the cross country. Yeah. Uh, studies have shown that culture is time invariant, at least over the past 40 or 50 year period. Okay. So culture would interact with okay. trade or institutions, okay. and then we model and we control culture. Obviously, this is a very complex issue. Uh, you've got institutions, trade, geography, 
that vary over a wide geographic range and a wide economic range and a wide development range. What would happen if you take a smaller data set, say just North America, and do analysis? Yes. Because so obviously those share a lot of those commonalities, so you can look at then the underlying set of really what might be causative factors. So <coughs> one way to do it is look at dummy variables. So we have um, intercepts for specifically North America, intercepts for Sub-Saharan Africa, and even those are significant. So we control for those two. What we haven't done is we haven't broken our samples into fewer countries to look at that. Um, and the reason is that to draw estimation power, we have to have at least 35 countries in the sample. Uh, so otherwise, the results we get will not really be significant, or they will not, even if they're significant, you can't really base your assumptions on those results. So you couldn't do it on a state-by-state -state basis and do it at a state level, which then gets rid of a lot of those variabilities. Yes. Yeah, something that I can look into definitely. We can do it for U.S. Uh, and state-by-state -state basis, and then we have state data on other countries too. Yes. That's an interesting idea. I'll look into that.